empower it. I went to a, an adapted high school, and it was for kids with various different intellectual disabilities. And they actually had to pedal this. It was like a recumbent bicycle, a stationary, but they had to pedal it in order to power it, and then they were steering it. So it was the only way they can get them active because they couldn't get these kids uh, with autism or anything else to oh actually want to do these things. So they were able to put them on there, and because they were playing a video game, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah it has to do something fun with it. Yeah. But I think uh, one way you can definitely go, like, everyone's always interested in money. So if there would be some way to get people to exercise. Okay, I'm interested in money. Absolutely love it. Hate it when I don't have it. But if you can give someone, like, some sort of discount for exercising, I mean, in the long run, that's going to Yeah, like a help health insurance some. discount. Exactly, yeah. because that's going to save that Kaiser be so much money. But then you have to make sure that they're checking in, they're actually doing that exercise. And I mean, I make sure you don't have someone shy, you just signing off saying you did this. But it has to be really, really short term. Yeah. For, for, for the HMO to care. I was, I was at a conference with the California Endowment um, a year or so ago, and they were talking about some of the, it was actually focused more on depression prevention, and some, there's some large scale studies now that look at ways of doing fairly simple um, interventions for older adults with depression in, in a primary care, an outpatient primary care settings. And they have one guy there who's a CEO of some, some major uh, HMO like play on the Florida. And, uh, and at least one of these studies, the impact study actually, like this shows cost, um, cost savings about a year or two out from the intervention. The intervention is really simple. That's really surprising. And this, this CEO guy says, says I don't care. If, it's, if it doesn't save me money in the next quarter, it doesn't matter to me. Oh my. I, <laughs> yes, you? Um, well, two things. Already some uh, employers are giving like some money for people that eat healthy. Save yeah, them healthy it saves them a lot of money. And exercise. Well, they exercise like at their workplace. Sometimes. Um, Sometimes no, not though. necessarily. Yeah. yeah, and also um, I read a news article I don't know, a year, two years ago maybe, about this little town in Italy <laughs> that um, was giving money to people who participated. It was like the fattest town in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> and they were giving money to people who um, participated in this weight loss program. And so they had a lot of people. Like they would give them, I don't know how many euros for every kilo of weight that they lost. And a lot of people were participating. Program and they for the second um, for the second term of the program I guess they had a lot of people that were on the wait list to join because they wanted money. That's <laughs> kind of cool. Were they able to promote Yeah, um, I don't know because this was just like the <laughs> first year that they had done it and they reported on the results of the yeah. first year and I don't know what happened. It sounds like the kind of thing that could go expensive yeah. real fast. Yeah. yeah. You, 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 Away, then you gain the weight back the next month. And you return the program and lose the weight and get some more euros. <laughs> That's one of the things that crushed uh, interventions for substance abuse. Oh, yeah? Uh, that were expanding wildly back in the 80s because um, it turned out that people kept cycling through. And eventually, like the employers and the insurance payers figured out that there's actually sort of a disincentive for the inpatient substance abuse program to do a substance abuse program. That, that kept working. Oh, actually, um, for that program, they only allowed you into it once. So, so there's no, like, repeat. Well, Stephen King had a way of making people stop smoking in one of his stories. And that that's, that was the first thing that came to my mind. That's, that's applied behavior now. <laughs> that works for me. The, the, sh the short version, is, he has a short story about changing smoking and some other unhealthy behaviors. And, and basically, it's like you, you contract with the moth and to so keep an eye on you, and, an eye on and you. as soon as you do something so that you that you promised first, not to do, the first time you lose a finger, yeah. <laughs> it goes up from there. I think I, I, there like was a lot of signals. talking, and I couldn't understand what you were saying about the cycling through in the eighties. What, what were you? Oh, just the, the, the in-house health program. In terms of the way of things really running up costs, is that mm -hmm. if you don't have um, some tracking of cost over time, you can end up running up a lot of money. Is one example. Is that, you know, in the 80s, um, substance abuse treatment programs, inpatient substance abuse, was a really popular benefit in a lot of health programs, especially for management, that sort of people. And they crashed pretty quickly because people kept 
would go through, get dry, and come back again. This would cost them like you know, $3,000 a shot, $1980. And uh, eventually people sort of realized that there was actually a disincentive for the treating programs to do an intervention that kept you the best way to make money is to keep them around. They were also moving, there were places in the LA area that were actually using buses to move Medicare patients from one substance abuse clinic to another. So you got your 14 days at one place and shipped you across two to another. In terms of weight loss, too, isn't it more? dangerous to your health to yo-yo diet. So like if you teach people to diet really quickly and they bounce back and that'd actually be more detrimental than if they just Yeah there's a lot there's a lot of there's a lot of shift now towards the idea of living you know, living like a lifestyle change. Which you know most of what we know about this, uh with you know, the cognitive interventions would be quite something we would have a lifestyle change. It's, it's an interesting sort of public health, public policy question. The simplest version I proposed earlier on is you, if education is one of the main factors, you then try to get everybody to stay in school for a really long time. Would that have an effect? And in fact, we do know there's social demographic evidence at the national level that cognitive impairment declines some during the 80s. Is that cognitive impairment? Cognitive impairment actually declined on the national basis. The prevalence dropped a little bit. Across the decade, somewhere from the 80s and 90s. Functional, uh, physical functional impairment would be on some too. Is that based on education? I mean, like a lot of these phenomena, it's more clear what happened, not so clear what happened. <laughs> <laughs> the best guess they have was that it might have been increasing education. But they actually did some re analyses and it wasn't that clear cut. The other issue they bring up at the end of this is if you have, if there are programs like this that you know are going to work, and there are a lot of other things on the market that probably aren't working. And you need like the cognitive training equivalent of the FDA, some kind of truth and advertising uh, laws to guide people to the right stuff. Anyway, see you all next week. We'll start talking about personality. And if you want it in your evaluation, some were put up there already. We've got a stack started, so if you're ready to turn it in, put them down.